Mm -hmm. Hi. So, when thinking about electrochemical cells, like batteries or supercapacitors or uh, fuel cells, then you're going to be inevitably involved in some of the theory behind it. Now, I normally avoid theory because I think theory really is just a lack of good practice. But um, there's an awful lot of theory involved in it, and, and a lot of it's quite interesting. Now, you have to realise that a lot of this stuff was developed in the mid-19th to late 19th century, when um, the engines that powered the Industrial Revolution were heat engines. And the second law, well, the first, second, third law of thermodynamics were all developed around this time, and, and they consider, really, the flow of heat. Now, heat is um, one of those energies that everything can be converted into. So, electrical energy can go into heat, uh, thermal and um, chemical energy to heat. Heat is seen as the baseline, if you like, and it's used as a translation for all different kinds of um, energy states, and they talk about heat transfer. Now, when looking at heat engines, heat engines have a specific um, efficiency, and this is worked out by a guy called Carnot. And Carnot kind of predates the um, second law of thermodynamics, and it's sort of the grounding to ideas of entropy and enthalpy and the second law and all that sort of stuff. And the Carnot uh, efficiency considers something like this, where we have a temperature um, source, hot, and we transfer it through some kind of medium to a temperature sink, cold. And that medium is a transfer fluid. Now, your transfer fluid can be anything. It can be a liquid or it can be a gas. It's steam is the transfer fluid of the Industrial Revolution. And petrol is a transfer fluid of ours. Um, but that process, at that stage, we can take work out of it when we have the energy change from the energy input through the transfer fluid. So this QH is the amount of heat energy that we're inputting into the system of the transfer from the hot to the cold. Now, there is an efficiency relationship for this, and, and I'm just going to write it down. I can go into Carnot cycles a bit more if anybody's interested, and I can certainly show some of the derivations of this. Again, uh, it's probably a bit much for, uh, for a video here for general watching. But we can go into it if anybody expresses an interest in that. But the efficiency ratio is really an e a ratio of um, the work done to the heat supplied to the system. So the ratio is work over heat supplied. It's as simple as that. Now you work that one through, you can actually work it through to be 1 minus um, the temperature of the cold divided by the temperature of the hot. And that gives us some figures that we can work for. And that is the expression of the Carnot efficiency. So we can actually work out what the efficiency of any particular engine is by measuring that. Now, it's an obvious limit if you think about it. <coughs> it goes back to the idea if you can't get work out of something or then you actually put into something. Because this has a fixed temperature. We're going to get it to a certain temperature. If we put it into a transfer fluid, we're going to get some losses there. The fluid is going to perform a certain amount of work. And that work is the work that's available to us, and it's fixed again because of losses. Now, the overall efficiency of a heat engine like this, a Carnot engine, isn't very great. I think, off the top of my head, it's about 35% or something like that. Now, if we're looking at electrochemical cells, fuel cells, as opposed to um, the basic Industrial Revolution heat transfer engine, then there's a different kind of efficiency that we can look at, and it's the Nernst efficiency. And this one is the relationship between the Gibbs free energy and the total enthalpy of the system. Now, this um, efficiency can actually be greater than the Carnot efficiency, but that makes it very interesting indeed, obviously, because it means that our electrochemical cells, our fuel cells, our batteries, our um, supercapacitors have the potential for a greater energy uh, efficiency than do heat exchange engines, and that's what makes them so very much interesting. Now, we start to hit some of the problem areas here, because what is the Gibbs free energy? Now, Gibbs free energy um, involves a, a concept of entropy, and entropy is a very poorly under, understood concept. But basically, the, sorry, the Gibbs free energy, which is a change in energy state, hence the delta, incidentally, just means change in. So the Gibbs free energy is equal to the change in the uh, enthalpy minus the temperature times the change in the entropy. And that's the one that causes all the problems. Now, 
the enthalpy is actually really easy to understand and, and relatively easy to measure, as it happens. Um, and we can measure it by putting whatever substance we want into a bomb calorimeter, exploding it, measuring the energy change there, and that becomes the enthalpy of our system. And so it's, it's actually quite easy to measure this one. No problem at all. Temperature, another really easy one to measure. The problem with entropy <coughs> is that it's mathematically derived. It's derived from um, uh, Celsius and Carnot. And again, I can go into that if you like. If anybody's actually interested, we can actually go through the derivation of uh, the mathematical derivation of entropy. But what it means is it has become a very um, difficult and um, argumentative um, notion about what uh, entropy actually is. And there's a number of ways of looking at entropy. And I don't think they're particularly useful, to be honest. Because one way of looking at entropy is this idea that it is a, a tendency towards increased disorder. Now, that idea, to my mind, is a bit egocentric. Because when we look at something as being ordered, then we think about it as a, having an order that is useful to us. So if we take um, a pile of bricks, for instance, and we stack them up into the shape of a house, that order has use to us. If we dump those pile of bricks out of the um, truck, we call that disorder, because it's not useful to us. Now, I prefer to think of it as a different kind of order. It's not an order we can make use of, but it's nevertheless an ordered, structured system. Now, that's how I like to look at it, and actually statistical mechanics um, tends towards that view as well, because this idea of order versus disorder is um, too contentious for words, and it leads to um, some very strange ideas. Um, for instance, if, we, um, if all systems have a tendency towards disorder, why is it that life arises? Because life is a tendency towards order in those terms. The um, disordered system that generates life moves towards higher and higher order that will really, um, realized in us and our structures. And if that is true, then um, how can it be that we tend uh, towards disorder? And if the tendency is towards disorder, how is it that life can arise? So this idea of order disorder as being uh, introduced in entropy is really losing favour. And it's one of the um, uh, ideas now is that entropy really <coughs> is concerned with um, changes of state, that changes of order, sorry, not changes of state, changes of order from one structured system to another structured system. Now, um, there are lots of different understandings of entropy, and it's not to say that any particular understanding of entropy is wrong. I mean, um, I was listening to Tom Bearden, for instance, and um, he uh, expressed entropy as a change in, as change of potential energy. Now, it tends not to be seen that way, but I guess if you want to see it that way, then, then, then why not? So if we think about the um, entropy as being the energy required to keep a system with whatever structure or order that it actually has, then the energy that we can get out of something, if you like the Gibbs free energy, is obviously going to be equal to the total energy available in that system, the enthalpy, minus the um, stuff that we can't get out, the stuff that's required in the system to keep the system in structure, and that is the entropy. Or at least, in my conception of it, that's what the entropy is. So, if we look at the entropy as um, <coughs> that energy required to maintain an order, then it's, um, it's not available to us as work because um, it has to sit in there because if we took it out, this system would change its ordered state again. Now, order um, is really seen, or I see it more as, a structural arrangement rather than a specific order as in clean up your bedroom, uh, build a house, that kind of thing. It's really just whatever structural arrangement the thing happens to have requires energy to maintain that structural arrangement. That energy required to maintain the structural arrangement isn't available to us. If we can get that energy out that's required to maintain the structural arrangement, and then the structural arrangement will break down. And, and that's not unreasonable if you think about quantum theory, because quantum theory says that the structural arrangement of um, elementary particles is really an interaction of quantum of energy. So if we can change that quantum interaction, then the particle will literally cease to exist. And of course, that's what happens in space. When you have these large areas of dark matter and a particle pops into existence and then ceases its existence, what's happening is that the energy required um, <coughs> to maintain its entropy, that is to maintain its structure, 
is being transferred from one form to another with a brief period of time in which it has structural importance. And then when that structural importance ends, so does the structure. So as long as we have a structure, we're going to have entropy because we need energy to maintain that structure. Now, there's an obvious effect of temperature on that. You raise the temperature, you change the structure. And, the structure. and so we can derive Gibbs quite easily from that idea that <coughs> a system has a total amount of energy available into it. Some of that energy we can get out and use for work. Some of it is needed to maintain the structure uh, of, of the arrangement that's left over, if you like, and we can't get that out. And so we call that entropy. Now, that's the way I like to think about entropy, and that's how we get towards our um, Gibbs free energy. Now, Gibbs free energy is what it always used to be called. It was actually called Gibbs available energy for a while, and they're going towards calling it Gibbs energy now. Uh, and this is really because um, the idea of free Nobody seems to like the idea of free, and particularly free energy. It's, it's one of those um, things that gets every scientist up in arms. Uh, I always think it's because they don't really look through the problem properly. Um, but that's what Gibbs free energy is. Now, obviously Gibbs free energy has different values, but essentially it can be positive, zero, or negative. And those values um, give you an indication of what's going to happen in the reaction. Now, this is actually another one of my big bugbears with science, and particularly the way it's presented, and particularly the laws of um, emotion, the laws of dynamics, the laws of whatever, the natural laws. What we're told is that the natural laws hold true for all time in all conditions, and that's not an unreasonable statement. And then we're told that the natural laws um, dictate or um, constrain what can ha possibly happen within a system. Now, that's just absolutely not true. The natural laws have been derived from system observation. And there are plenty of times that I can think of, and I'm sure you can too, when the laws that are supposed to constrain a system don't. So we change the laws. And we forget that we have changed the laws, and we, we deal with them as being laws. And we say that the, the law is what is responsible for that system behavior, and that makes it very difficult to understand. So we said the Gibbs free energy having um, a zero value means it's in equilibrium. Well, that's just nonsense. If a system is in equilibrium, it will have a Gibbs free energy of zero. That, that's the right way to look at it, not the other way around. If you look at it as being the law dictating the system, it'll be very, very confusing. If you look at it as the system is being derived into a law as a guide, it all of a sudden becomes very much more understandable. Because when you hit something that you don't understand, or you hit something that the law can't describe, it doesn't mean it's wrong. It means that more likely, the law is wrong. That is, if you've got a fair enough understanding of what it is that you're about, obviously. I mean, you know, if you're a child of two and, and you're, you're wandering around with a fork and a plug socket and you think, Mum told me not to put this in there, she must be wrong. And, you know, obviously there's something at fault there. So if you've got enough uh, background information and, and assessment to make some kind of judgment on this stuff and you hit a, a condition where the law um, doesn't apply, it is not necessarily so that you're wrong it could well be one of those weird instances when the law just doesn't apply. Now, the second law of thermodynamics, obviously, is one of those fundamental laws that everybody froths about. And incidentally, it's also why entropy is such a, a, such a hot issue, because um, the second law of thermodynamics is actually based entirely on concepts of entropy. And, and uh, again, it's be something that I could do a video on if anybody's actually interested in it, but it's <coughs> based entirely on concepts of entropy. So if you attack the concept of entropy, you're actually attacking the second law of thermodynamics. And there are plenty of ways to attack the second law of thermodynamics, um, because it is just a guesstimate about what's going on. And then there are plenty of cases where it actually is um, not really applicable, because in, in one sense, of course, it only really applies to closed systems. And the idea of the universe being a closed system is just something we don't know. There's, the universe may or may not be a closed system. We've got no idea. If the universe is an open system, then it's quite possible that the um, second law of thermodynamics can be reversed. If it's in a closed system, then it probably can't be. But we don't know this, we just assume it to be so, and it leads to ideas of the Big Bang and Big Crunch. So these things aren't um, cast in stone forevermore true, and you can actually attack them. But if you want to actually think about them, then what you have to actually do is ask yourself, what is it that they're describing? Because they're not constraining something, they're describing something. So when you ask yourself what it is they're describing, it suddenly becomes very obvious. So we look at this thing. 
and we say, okay, what is that? And it's quite simple. We have a total amount of energy available to us, the whole energy in the system, plus the bit that's needed to keep the system going, the bit we can get out, is the Gibbs energy, and that's the bit available to us. No longer a mystery. We don't really have to think much about it. It's a very simple concept, just expressed mathematically. So the Gibbs free energy is used to do the Nernst efficiency, and the Nernst efficiency can actually be greater than the Carnot efficiency. Now, I think I've been burbling on long enough about this, so um, I'll do another video later on uh, other stuff on uh, fuel cells. Anyway, thank you for watching.